Israel has fired back. In an operation called Days of Repentance, Israel has hit back at Iran and hit back hard in an attack that was supposed to make Iran repent for the last attack of 181 ballistic missiles that were aimed at Israel, to repent for the attack in April, and maybe to repent for all of the rest of the things that Iran has been kind of putting together in the Middle East. It's also called Days of Repentance because this is the day on the Jewish calendar where the Torah was giving, the, the law of Moses was handed down to the Jews on Mount Sinai. We call this the joy of the Torah, and this was the end of the high holidays, which are a time of repentance, and this is also the beginning of a new cycle. The Jews read a portion of the Bible every week, altogether 52 uh, portions of the Torah of the five books of Moses, and this is a day that we started anew which is something that I think uh, has a meaning on why is Israel decided to attack Iran on this day, because we're in a new Middle East, and let's talk about what happened, let's talk about what didn't happen, and let's talk about what's really, really important in all of this taking a place. So, let's talk about the attack itself. Here's what we know happened. Uh, Israel sent three waves of uh, military aircraft, probably about 100 or 120 planes. They included F-15s, they included F-16s, and they included the famous upgraded F-35s that Israel is uh, has been using. Uh, we also included tankers and electronic warfare uh, military planes and intelligence planes. And, and anybody who knows anything about these kind of uh, operations, there's going to be rescue assets, and, and much, much more. And the planes took off from Israel. Uh, according to what we understand, we heard about sonic booms and, and air defense radars being triggered, and even some radars being taken out. Israel went from Israel uh, to Syria, from Syria to Iraq, and from Iraq to Iran. And uh, we think that most of the the uh, the uh, ordinance was actually released outside Iranian airspace, meaning not over Iran itself, but outside Iranian airspace. Israel has the ability to fire long range missiles from uh, air uh, platforms. And uh, the important thing about all of this is that all of the planes return safely. And and, and that's critical. So that's more or less what was done, uh, what was hit. We think that more than 20 targets were hit. And, and as, as we're, time is going by, we're starting to realize a little bit more about uh, what the exact targets were. Uh, Israel hit ballistic missile bases and, and ballistic missile facilities and manufacturing facilities. It hit drone uh, research and manufacturing facilities. And more important, Israel hit uh, the air defense assets, including anti-aircraft ba batteries, including air defense uh, batteries that, according to international press, were recently supplied by the Russians in return for the drones that the Iranians have given the Russians for their war in Ukraine. Now, the fact that we can take out the air defense assets is a major player. We're talking about S-300 and S-400, which is the cream of the Russian anti-aircraft defensive systems, and Israel actually flew in and took them out. Now, that's going to be a little bit of egg on the face of the Russians because, I mean, they're selling these, including to the Indians. The Indian uh, Air Force is using this. But uh, this is actually us sending a message to the Iranians. We can hit whatever we want. So that is what we understand was hit. There is talk about some kind of nuclear facility that was a secret base, but we're not really sure uh, if that's true. So that was what was hit. Here is what was not hit. And if you, you've heard me talking about it, there was a huge deliberation about what Israel should and should not take out in Iran as a result of the Iranians giving us an excuse to hit them back. What was not hit, and I'm, I'm stressing this, are the nuclear facilities in Iran. Um, 
those were not hit. Oil facilities in Iran were not hit. And as opposed to what I thought was going to happen, uh, no symbols of the government, symbols of the revolution, uh, symbols of uh, the, the Iranian power were actually taking out. There were a couple of statues or a couple of icons that I, I was sure Israel was going to hit. And it seems like there were very few casualties. Now, that has a lot of, how do you say, uh, connections to it, because what Israel is saying on all these different levels, that this was a calculated and pinpoint attack to hit Iranian military targets. And Israel said military targets, and everybody around said military targets, and even the Israel military spokesman stressed that this is the retaliation, we're hitting military targets because of what you did, and uh, actually warned Iran not to try to continue another round of attacks and, 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 and continue into that. So um, this is very interesting because here was a chance, and a lot of the politicians in Israel, a lot of Israelis, including me, are saying to themselves, wait a minute, here is a chance to have, if not completely taken out, to um, totally or, or seriously damage Israel's nuclear, uh, excuse me, Iran's nuclear capability. And I don't know if you understand that from my point of view today and a lot of people, the only thing that is an existential threat to Israel today is a mushroom cloud over Tel Aviv. And the Iranians have been pushing to get to the edge of that capability. Uh, a couple of words about the Iranian nuclear option. They're, they're being very, very careful to get to that ability, uh, not to allow anybody to, to, to hold it back on one hand. On the other hand, not to cross over a specific line that they know that if they cross over, they're going to get in a lot of trouble with the rest of the world, with the United States and other aspects in the world itself. So Israel, uh, Iran is a nuclear threshold power right now. And Israel had a chance, I believe, to take out or at least set back Israel, uh, the Iranian nuclear capability and decided not to use that. Which brings us to the next question. What was the role that the United States of America played in this whole situation? And let's make it very clear. They played a very, uh, how do you say, mixed in or a very balagan role in what was happening. Because uh, like they say in, in Bonanza, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the United States of America, the Biden administration is dealing with its election issues and they were very, very eminent and very, very playing. I mean, they sent Blinken over here a couple of days ago in order to make sure that they have control over what was going on. We know that there was a negotiation. We know that the American administration wanted one thing. Israel wanted another thing. That was another negotiation. The United States of America literally was in the loop of what targets were going to be hit, what was uh, were going to be hit, uh, and, and on what level. They were in the, in the loop before and during and after the actual attack. And I'm going to say it like this. It's very clear that the United States of America has been holding Israel back. Uh, there was even a case of uh, two documents that were leaked from the American Defense Administration, okay, uh, with intelligence about what Israel is planning to hit or more correctly, what uh, kind of arms Israel is moving to put on its, its planes. I don't know if uh, that intelligence was leaked to an Iranian telegram channel deliberately, but if it was not deliberately, it was criminally unintentionally. I mean, you don't do things like that. And the United States has been playing a major role on the Israeli side, actually holding Israel back. And the United States has actually played a role also in conveying to the Iranians that uh, they should end this here. The thing is this. Israel listens to the United States because we did not retaliate the way we wanted to. On the other hand, the other side does not listen to the United States. Uh, and uh, 
they have said that they would support, the Biden administration has said that Israel, the United States will support Israel in case, in case Iran decides to attack back. But we're, we're still in the middle of, of this. And it's very, very clear that the United States and the rest of the world wants to see this exchange as an end to the whole story. The problem is uh, this is not going to be the end to the whole story. And uh, even though the world is now saying now we can reach a diplomatic uh, solution in Gaza and uh, the teams are back negotiating hostile uh, hostage slash ceasefire um, uh, agreement, or we can reach some kind of diplomatic uh, agreement in Lebanon like there wasn't a diplomatic agreement the day before Hezbollah started uh, firing. And the weird thing is that Iran is selling this as an air defense success. They're saying they minimize the effectiveness and the damage of the Israeli attack, that their air defense took out most of the incoming ordinance, and uh, they're, they're kind of letting this kind of go off their back as, as water off the back of a duck. And, and the question is now what is going to happen? What does Iran want? And, and how much Iran needs to react, because if it doesn't react, it'll be seen as weak. But if it does react, it is actually taking a chance that America or the United States of America will not be able to hold Israel back. And, and then let's tie all of this into the American election in two weeks. And, and that's going to change everything because what administration is in power at the end of the, this election cycle uh, after November is going to determine what Israel will be able to do next time Iran decides to pull out another attack. And, and this is basically the situation. The world doesn't like Iran. Let's make this clear. But it is afraid of, of a schoolyard brawl in, in a very, how do you say, uh, elementary school type of, of uh, idea because Iran is a bully. And, and the last thing the, the, the administration wants is a big fight in Israel. The thing is that Israel probably will have no choice but to put the bully down. And... Um, as of now, for better or for worse, Benjamin Netanyahu and Israeli government, Israel is trying to convey itself as the responsible side of the, this war, the responsible adult. We don't want to be blamed for starting off the war in the Middle East. I'm sorry to say I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get out of this. Which brings me to what does all of this mean and, and how, how is this all going to play out? As much as Israel is trying to play by the Western rules and, and not by uh, the rules of the Middle East, um, we did not light this powder keg. We did not amass all of this explosive potential. And the actual fact that all of this is a result of hatred of Israel, hatred of the Jews. It's not a border dispute. It's not even a religious dispute. It's more like we hate the Jews. And if you have been listening to me over the years, and you've been listening to what I've been saying, especially uh, lately, and, and I'm going to be going into this a little bit deeper in the next couple of movies, um, the only thing that is fueling that hatred is the fact that we are a different people. We're a chosen people. We're a people that, that actually shows the world that when God puts its stamp on, on a people and, and, and looks out for them, not that we're always right, not that we always do the right thing, and not that we're not going to suffer, but we do have, uh, instead of the Iron Dome, we have the God Dome over us. And, and I think that the enemies of God, in the Middle East, and we're seeing more and more of them also spreading into the Western countries, the enemies of God are marking Israel out for special treatment, for special condition, and, and because of that, Israel again, and the hatred of Israel has, is becoming a major flashpoint in the Middle East and even in these elections right now. The thing is that Israel has decided to wait. So 
the next question is, what is Israel going to do now? I think what now that we're going to do, and, and again, we're doing it pretty well, more than we thought we would, but it's going to take some more time. We have uh, put the Hamas on their back foot. They're not a, a relative uh, factor anymore. And the ceasefire hostage negotiation is going to be uh, more to the side of Israel now that Sinwar has is, is, is been uh, taken out the head of Hamas, and and there's there's a movement or there's more pressure by the world on Hamas, by the way, to reach an agreement. Israel has to feel finish the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Israel has to make or bring the Hezbollah to a point where they are not a threat on the northern part of of, uh, of Israel's borders, and and that is a process that has been successful so far. We have paid a price. We lose soldiers, one here, two there, okay, on a regular basis. But um, we have to bring Lebanon to a point where it is not a threat to Israel, which brings me to something that I'm starting to realize, and not only me, more and more Israelis are starting to realize uh, in, in the situation that we're coming to. Because what is the big picture. The big picture is that it looks like this won't end until the regimes around us learn to accept the existence of Israel. Some of them have. We have a peace agreement with the Jordanians, and the Jordanians have prospered as a result. We have a peace agreement with the uh, with the uh, Egyptians, and they have prospered. We are pushing towards a peace agreement or some kind of arrangement or ex- acceptance uh, of Israel by even Saudi Arabia and the more moderate. So the the Middle East is actually being divided by those who accept Israel and even want to plug in to, to Israel's blessing and those who refuse to. And the thing is that those who refuse to, to accept Israel, and, and you can see it in the Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, you can see it in the Houthis in, in Yemen. You can see it in, in, in Gaza. The, the, the hatred of Israel is what actually is, is perping up or holding up these administrations. By the way, the hatred of the Jews was what created or glued together the Nazi regime. That hatred of Israel is, is what is fueling these, these, um, these clashes. And uh, I saw a movie about the Houthis that we're going to talk about a little bit later uh, in, in another video. But that hatred is so deeply ingrained that until something massive changes in Yemen, in Gaza, in Lebanon, a regime change, or even in Iran, I don't see an end to this cycle of violence going on and on. And that has me really, really scared. Which brings me to the last subject that we need to talk about, because it's looking more and more like this is a prophecy style, end times connection, uh, bigger connection to what's going on. And uh, that is something that is that is much, much wider than what we can do here. So I want to touch a couple of things since we are talking about big p- pictures. Um, we need to talk about what is going to happen in the near future and the far future. And that's going to be on, on the next video that we're talking about. But uh, we have the American elections that are coming up on, on the 5th. We have a prophecy conference. Uh, me, uh, Pastor Tom Hughes, Pastor James Cadiz, which is people that we, you know, have heard in connection to me, but altogether 16 different speakers will be meeting in California on the uh, the 8th, the 9th, and, and the 10th of uh, November, talking about exactly what is the big picture, what is the next step. So if you want to connect to that, uh, there will be a link in the description before and below. Uh, connect to that either online or come visit us physically in Temecula in, in California. And, and that is something that we will be discussing here. 
If you want to be part of what's going on, as we've said before, Gijon Springs is a ministry that we're working with. Uh, you can support me directly here on YouTube or on Gijon Springs. And if you want to support the IDF, the young men and, and, and women in Israel who are actually on the front lines in, in Gaza, on the front lines in Lebanon, and in the sky over Iran, or in all of the different arenas that Israel is dealing with, Gijon Springs is supporting the IDF directly now with with uh, with equipment and different things that they need. It's scary what's going on, but I have a feeling, and again, we'll connect to this and at the Prophecy Conference, we have a feeling that this is all part of God's plan for what's going to be happening in the near future. So as scared as I am about what's going on, I'm kind of excited that this is, this is moving down the right road. So this was David Tal. This was a Balagan connection. Uh, this is what happened after the attack on Iran. And, uh, well, hope to see you soon.